Hollywood has terrified us for years with representations of possession, exorcisms, demonic infestations, and dark oppressions, things that many find entertaining. But the sad true fact is that this isn't the stuff of myth and legend, of just entertainment. It exists. Evil is real. And its effects on people are devastating. And the people that are afflicted, the people that love them, are equally demolished by the effects of these things taking place. And it also goes into effect for the people that try to bring them peace. Through 17 years now of broadcasting, I've witnessed news coming from the Vatican, exorcisms done daily, on site, sometimes dozens upon dozens a day. They're calling for more training, a larger need for exorcists and deliverance ministry. Is a dark force rising, or has the church finally caught up with the times and demands? Our first guest is a longtime friend, someone I trust to discuss these topics with, someone the church trusts with these kind of cases, Adam Bly. Later, Deliverance Minister Reverend Bill Bean joins us to share his insights and experiences. These men have a warning to share, and it's about time we paid attention and took notice. We do that next, right here on the Paranormal 60 with Dave Schrader. I'm not gonna stand here and listen to this baloney. He won't know. He doesn't stand for baloney. Sounds like a lot of supernatural baloney to me. Supernatural. Perhaps. Baloney, perhaps not. Our first guest is Adam Bly. Adam has a master's degree in psychology and is a paratus of the religious demonology and exorcism for the Pittsburgh Diocese. He is an auxiliary member of the International Association of Exorcists in Rome. He trains exorcists nationally, participates in deliverance ministry, and was a member of an investigative panel for the Paranormal Research. He's also the author of Hauntings, Possessions, and Exorcisms and the Catholic Guide to Miracles. His new book, The Exorcism Files, True Stories of Demonic Possession, is out. We do have a link for that book on today's program guide. You'll find it below. Uh, For those of you listening to the audio version, you'll find it in our program guide as well. Please welcome to the show, Adam Bly. Hello, Adam. Hello, Dave. It's great to see you. Boy, you just get better looking every time I see you. You're just <laughs> so do you. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> Twinning. Uh, it's great to have you. And I don't know if you heard the good news, but during COVID, I buckled down and I studied. I am now a full fledged demonologist. I've watched every episode of Buffy, every episode of Supernatural, all of the paranormal TV shows. I read mm-hmm. all my hot stuff comic books, and I feel mm-hmm. like I'm prepared to face the devil now. That that's how it works, right? I mean, that's how all these paranormal teams, demonologists work. Well, yes, Dave. I don't want to be flippant or mean about it, <laughs> right? But um, I think it's a strange field. So, like within the Catholic Church, which, as as we all know, the Catholics have this association with exorcism, right? Be it from the movies or um, that kind of thing. And the movies came about because the Catholics were the ones doing exorcisms. The Catholics are the only ones that have a fixed right in a book that was developed, you know, over centuries of experience, put together in 1614, revised in 1999. And they kind of have a, a program that they've built to do this. And they have centuries of experience built into that. And there's kind of a verbal lineage, you know, exorcist training, the next generation and and sitting in and helping each other. And and there's this kind of community that did narrow and become smaller in the 60s and 70s here in the West, but is kind of coming back. So unless you're tapping into that genuine experience base, I think what you get is um, a very inadequate education. You get somebody who is limited to, well, I watch YouTube videos and and they, this person told me how it all goes and therefore I know how it goes. Or I read Malachi Martin's books and so now I know everything about exorcism. And unfortunately, none of us, meaning the people in the community that actually roll around on the floor with possessed people on a weekly basis, not to make fun of it, but really do it, are going to put 
on some of the serious details in books. You're not going to put them out to the public because that would be dangerous. People would then go try to do it themselves. Um, and so unfortunately in the paranormal world, you get people that want the glamour of, or the spookiness of, oh, I'm a demonologist, I deal with demons. <clears throat> but that's very different than actually going to exorcisms where it's not just about, do you have the courage to, to go to the exorcism, but does God protect you and limit what the demon does so that you don't go mad or get hurt or other things that I, I know you know people in the community that have bumped into demonic hauntings or, or possess people that have gotten hurt. Um, <clears throat> it's a very serious business. So right. unless somebody's doing the actual work, uh, tapping into that body of experience that the church has developed over all these centuries with legitimate authority that the demons listen to, which is the big difference. You know, people can say, oh, you know, I'm a priest, I'm ordained by so-and-so that isn't a legitimate bishop or things like that, and therefore I can do these exorcisms. And I can tell you that the first thing the demon says is, you have no authority over me. I'm not listening to you. And then, and then often these people get hurt. So it's kind of like, Dave, it would be kind of like watching detective TV shows and then saying, now I'm competent to go out and investigate murders and interrogate criminals. No, you're right. not. You have a fantasy that you are because you've watched a bunch of TV shows and read some stuff. But I can tell you, I've worked in prisons for years as a psychologist. Um, not, and let's be careful, not psychologist, psychological services specialist. Um, it's one thing to say, you know, I know about serial killers. I'm brave. I can talk to them. I know how it works because I watched a bunch of movies about serial killers. I can tell you it's a very different thing to go in the hole and go down the range and actually go up to the door and, and talk with a serial killer or have them sit in your office, um, you know, and, and try to do therapy with them. Like, it's basically the difference between doing it and fantasizing about it. And I was flippant at the beginning for a reason, and that's because many people tune into this show from around the world that are, are seeking help, and they reach out to paranormal teams that have demonologists. And I... I always recommend to people, first of all, if you're reaching out to somebody for help, try the churches. A lot of the churches are maybe not prepared for this, and especially sometimes the long protocol that goes behind it. Uh, but but find out what the true study for these people that are claiming to be religious demonologists are. Is that it's something that they're legitimately working in? They've got, as you said, the calling, the background, the actual training, because it doesn't it becomes more dangerous for you, for the people that love you, the people that care about you. And it becomes dangerous for the people you call in, because if you really are facing the diabolical, literally all hell can break loose by inviting somebody in that's caustic and doesn't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and the problem is <clears throat> unless you have some legitimate authority, and that means God backing you up and telling the demon, listen to that person, unless you have that, what are you doing? Are you, are you saying like, oh, yep, you're scratched. So, yep, uh, that looks like a typical demonic scratch. I'll give you my seal of approval. You've got a demonic haunting. Like, what good have you done? That It's the same problem I have with most paranormal groups is they say, we help people. And they come in and they record stuff so they can add it to their library to get clout with their friends. Right. And then they say, yep, we verified. Your house is haunted. Well, great. I already knew that. I'm looking for a solution. I'm suffering. My kids are upset. They're, they're, they're not sleeping. It's destroying our lives. And, and they claim like we help people. So it's, it's odd. Um, you're not equipped to help somebody with a demonic problem unless you have a legitimate religious authority where the demon's going to obey you. The demon's just going to play with you. Um, probably you're going to have problems at your own home, which I know, you know, as I do mm -hmm. on the personal level, a lot of people that are on these paranormal TV shows have had trouble in their personal lives and they've had these things manifest in their homes or around their families. Um, it's just, it's, it's a very serious thing. You know, it's not something to play with and Hollywood doesn't show you the serious end of it. Hollywood doesn't show you the fallout in people's lives um, the discord that it has caused, what it's like for somebody to have manifestations in their own home at the, after the investigation, because that doesn't draw viewers. 
you know, they, they, right. they paint it, they paint it to be this harmless hobby where you're in control just because your will is strong. And that's not how it works. I'm curious, uh, if, if you don't mind entertaining a few questions before we get to some of the, the meat of your book and, and what you're covering in the new one, um, people that are, and I think you, you just painted an interesting picture of people that I know in the field that have, um, dubbed themselves demonologists, exorcists. Many of them are dealing with substance abuse problems, alcohol abuse problems, sexual predilection problems. And to me, that's very telling. I feel like somebody that's um, out of control in their own life should be a clue that that's not somebody you want trying to help you get control back in your life. I mean, is that a pretty fair assessment or does that toll take place even on full-blown exorcists and religious leaders that are de dealing with this all the time. It can. Um, for sure, on a common sense level, Dave, I, I think any of us would say, you know, if we had families or kids, we would say, if somebody's going to intervene in my family, I want them to be stable and have their act together if they're going to be interacting with, with people I care about, right? So that's just on a common sense level, no matter what the profession is. Um, Yes, there can be serious fallout with this. Like when we do, when we approach it as Catholics, we don't want to step in that room unless we've gone to confession. We not just like I'm wallowing in sin. I was at the strip club last night getting drunk, you know, might have done a little bit of drugs, but I went to confession right before the session started today, so I'm fine. I'm still attached to sin. I'm still wallowing in it just because I confessed it knowing full well that 48 hours later I'm going to be back there. That's not having your spiritual life in order. You have to do that hard work. And I'm not saying holier than thou. I was mm -hmm. definitely, you know, in college and wallowing in sin as much as the next college person was, for sure. Um, and over the years, I've slowly extricated myself from most of that. And I'm living a mostly monastic life at this point. Um, so, yes, all that is to get at when you poke a demon when you interfere with its program because it's there working for satan trying to do a job they'll tell us at the exorcisms he put me here he told me i need to destroy this person in this way that's what i'm trying to do and we're trying to stop that from happening help the person repent or forgive and then get that demon out of their life so they can live a normal life now when you interfere with that demon's job it's between Satan and you, it says, if I fail, Satan's going to torture me worse than I'm going to be redeployed to a new job. They don't want to go back to hell and be tortured for failure. So they're going to fight tooth and nail to not lose that case from their side. When you're interfering with that, you're going to draw the ire of something that says, you're putting me in danger. You're threatening me to fail my assignment so that I'm going to suffer. So I'm going to fight tooth and nail for you not to do that. So you've now basically thrown down the glove and said, I'm your problem. I'm coming at you. So you have invited the struggle from it, mm -hmm. right? You go in a bar and you go up to somebody and throw a beer on them and say, you know, I don't like your color, your shirt or shove them or, you know, say whatever. You've invited the conflict. So when you get involved in demonic cases, you have to understand that you're stepping into a situation where you're on their radar. That particular one, and then the group as a whole, eventually, you're on their radar. So if you have a vulnerability in terms of substance abuse, serious sin, meaning mortal sin, um, these kind of weaknesses that weaken the will, alcohol and substances weaken the will, um, makes it easier to sin and easier to fall to temptation, these creatures are going to come at you with extra special strong temptation, and they may manifest around you. Um, yeah, so it can happen. And that's why in the community of the people that do this work, we try to look out for each other. We mm -hmm. take breaks when you need to take breaks because psychologically, emotionally, it can be rough. Just the horrors of what you see. Um, doing it you know for a lot of hours every week probably isn't a good idea just on a human level just the wear and tear physically it can be tough i mean i've 
been hurt enough to where I had a frozen shoulder and I basically couldn't move my left arm for about six months while it healed from a really rough case. Felt like a Wookiee was trying to pull my arm out and beat me with it. Um, so yeah, it can happen. We try to provide some community, uh, a network of friends and support so that if you feel like you're slipping or if you notice you're slipping in your life, your friends are going to help you. Mm -hmm. They reach out to them. If they see something they're concerned about, they're going to approach you about it. We, we basically keep an eye on each other because um, if you get in a really vulnerable position and then you go back into that arena, then you, you can really be taken down hard. So yes, again, the bottom line of what I'm trying to say is this is not something to play with. This isn't, this isn't JV activities. You've got a background in psychology. I have gone to speak with people that believe that they're demonically afflicted, uh, that they're, that they are either possessed or they're under oppression and infestation. I know that the Catholic church, the reason that they do take a long time in their protocols is to check out the psychology of the person as well. If I believe enough that I'm possessed, is that enough? I, I'm trying to figure out how to frame this. We have unbelievable capabilities as humans. Um, and, and simply by mentally believing I'm possessed, can that uh, not so much invite the real demon in uh, to, to make you the vessel for them, but um, is it any less dangerous for those people that truly believe they're afflicted when it's just a mental disability? Well, it can be very dangerous, Dave, in the, in, and the church is very careful about these cases. So if somebody approaches the diocese and says, I think I'm possessed, in fact, I'm sure of it, and you better do an exorcism right away, we don't just do it because somebody tells us to. And the church rules require that they get medically checked out, psychologically checked out, to see if there's a diagnosis that can account for their complaints. If they say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing a ringing in my ear through most of the day, and it's tinnitus, right? Mm -hmm. But they're convinced that that means I'm possessed because I read this forum post, and, you know, I think that's the attack of this demon, and, right. and ringing won't stop, and you need to do an exorcism. So they go to the doctor, and the doctor says, you have tinnitus. Um, you know, we're going to look at it and do a study on that. And they share the report with us and say, yeah, doc says there's a diagnosis that accounts for that. And we would then say to the person, okay, doc says there's a, there's a reasonable diagnosis. Comply with the treatment. Let's see if it clears it up. Let's rule out the mundane common hypothesis first before jumping to the ultra rare thing of I'm possessed. The church says, let's rule out the common mundane things first that are much more likely to be the case. Now, if you're walking on the ceiling speaking Aramaic, yeah, that's a different story. Right. But if your ears are ringing, comply with the treatment and let's see how it goes. And same thing for mental illness. If the doc says, hey, person has a history of manic depression with psychotic symptoms, they went off their meds six weeks ago. Yeah, of course they're hearing things. You know, but I've been... Can there be that. a placebo effect of you then just giving a blessing to this person, claiming to cast out this demon, knowing it's no. just psychological? Terrible idea. Okay. Terrible idea. And the, the reason that's a terrible idea is when the church and the priest stands over me with the purple stole and starts using words like exorcism and saying dramatic prayers or saying prayers in Latin, now I really lock in on the idea that it's a demon. Well, the church agrees with me. They did an exorcism. Right. Father prayed over me. I'm not taking that medication. I know that it's real. And not only is that uh, seductive because it says there's an external factor that's the cause of my problems. Somebody can wave a magic wand and take it away. I'm not responsible for that. I don't need to really deal with it. Somebody else needs to deal with that. That's an attractive idea when you're mentally ill. I don't want to deal with the fact that I might be mentally ill and I just have to live with this suffering to a certain extent. Hopefully medication helps, but it's an external thing. Wave the magic wand, take it away. That's an attractive idea. Right. And if they're psychotic and the priest endorses the hypothesis that it's possession, they often say, well, I'm absolutely not taking my medication. Then they get more psychotic, they get worse, and then somebody can end up you know, seriously hurt down the road based on that. And you've contributed to that by in encouraging that hypothesis. 
So there's, there's a lot of train wrecks that can happen and you have to be really cautious and it helps to have had a mental health background where you kind of know where these traps are and, and you see the ethics and why the ethics are there about how you approach these things. Now, obviously I could understand why the diabolical would want to corrupt Adam Bly. That's a big win in their, in in their category, right? To, to, to get you, to get a priest, to get a nun, to get, uh, you know, anybody of that ilk. Um, but what about Joe Blow up the street? Who's a plumber? He not really doesn't have any vices. He's not out doing dumb things. He's a good dad, you know, this and that. Uh, he's not out ghost hunting. He's not out poking the bear. Is he most likely not under the careful watch of the diabolical or are they just as susceptible to an attack? Yeah. So we don't always, <clears throat> we don't always know why they go after people in the beginning. Sometimes looking back on it, you'll figure it out. I have seen plenty of cases of Joe Blow, the plumber, the blue collar guy who's never played with anything, who dabbled with something once and has had a moderately serious problem ever since. Not possessed, but oppressed in yucky ways, really interfering with his life, We're dealing with one of those cases right now. What it seems to be is there's plenty of demons to go around and you will typically get knucklehead demon number four uh, assigned to you because there's plenty of them if you open the door to it because any human soul is a win. So, and by that, I mean, they want us damned. They don't want to kill us. They want us damned. And that means dying with unconfessed mortal sin on your soul. So Joe Blow the plumber, that human soul, that's a win on the chessboard if they can get him damned. If they can torment him until he commits suicide, I hope that never happens to anybody, but that's always their goal. If they can do that, that's a win for them. Now, that soul is just as valuable as any other soul, I think. I mean, I don't know the exact way they see it. But yes, I would say the exorcists that are getting in their face every week, yeah, there's more of a personal vendetta there. I've had a lot of personal attacks and, and verbal massages from demons at exorcisms when I visited different places. Yes, they know us. They don't like us. They'll let us know uh, exactly how they feel. But if you're doing this legitimately, meaning God called you to it, and you're keeping your nose as clean as you reasonably can, you're going to mess up, go to confession, get yourself straightened out. You don't have to worry about that. I, I really don't give it a second thought the rest of the week. I'm busy. I've got other things and other projects going on. I don't give it a second thought because God, I, I, I can say with confidence after all these years, he wants me doing this and therefore he puts limits on what they can do. All right. So, so we get a lot of protection because we're assigned to get in their face. This is kind of a heady question. Um, but one that people throw in my direction quite often, I, I don't claim to be a theologian. You know, I, I certainly, I pray, I believe I have a, a communication and a relationship with God and Christ. Um, I will do my best to pray at locations that uh, are deemed haunted to, to do that. First off, does Dave Schrader have any authority by praying? And I, I guess I shouldn't, I don't have the authority. I'm asking God to, to do this work, but does Dave Schrader radio show host have any, um, have the ear of the angels or God to, to come help these lost spirits. That's part of it. And then the other aspect is, you know, in the Bible, we see how it ends, right? The demons have to know how it ends. They do. Doesn't it seem like a strange cycle to be a part of over and over, you know, for, for them to long story short, at the end of this, we're not going to come out a, a victor. So wouldn't it be better to try to get back in God's graces than to, to just fight a war? We know we're not going to make. Okay, so two really important and, and big questions, and I know we don't have a whole lot of time. So mm -hmm. um, very important. It would be great if people heard this in the paranormal community. Yes, you can go in and pray for poor souls, meaning souls in purgatory. That's our understanding of it. Human spirits that are asking for prayer either by signaling their presence and knocking on the wall or knocking their portrait over on the anniversary of their death or whatever it is, you can go in and pray for them. And by pray for them, you're not saying go to the light and suddenly they're in heaven. I mean, you go in and you make the charitable, loving action of offering prayers to God for that soul. 
could be in Our Father, could be praying a rosary, could be saying the litany of the saints, could be just, God, please forgive them. Please help them move on to closer to you in, in their journey because they're not damned. They're going to get to heaven eventually. So pray for them in whatever way that you pray. You don't have the power to say, I decide you go to heaven now. We don't have that power. That's God. Right. But we are a soul that can make a charitable choice to offer prayers to God for that soul as a loving thing. And that may help them move along another five feet towards heaven. It might help them move along five miles. Can't, can't know for sure. Um, but praying for them is actually going to be helpful to them. And, and the, if you summed it all up in a, in a little package, it would be when you go on your ghost hunt, if something, if you say, do you need prayer? And there's a single response of yes or a noise or something, that's fine. That can still be a poor soul. But anything that wants to play 20 questions or have a dialogue, that's not a poor soul because from a Christian perspective and from real life experience, it's forbidden to call up the dead to talk to them because you're violating the first commandment. You're saying to God, I don't trust you. I'm not going to wait on you. I want my comfort and information from this spirit on my terms when I decide. And so you are saying to that spirit, I want something from you. Manifest and show me the spiritual's real. I want that comfort. I want the power of you do a parlor trick for me and I show my friends a video on my phone and I get brownie points with everybody. You're exploiting that spirit for personal things. That's very different than a charitable prayer offered for them without any request for personal benefit. Do you see the difference? Yes. And anybody can do that. Now, um, I'm sorry. And what was the... Then the, the bigger scope, uh, and I, when we're done with this, I do have an email that was sent in by a listener sure. that I would really love you to to address because I think this fits into the narrative of what we're discussing here. Um, the other question is, the Bible tells us how this plays out, that oh, there's yes. going to be this war and they're going to lose. The the, the diabolical, they, they, the darkness will lose. Yeah, they've already lost. So, so why continue to play the yeah. battle out? Right. It's It's a sour grape story. So if you look at, there's a clue about this in St. Francis. When he received the stigmata, he was shown an empty throne in a vision, an empty throne with a crown sitting on it. And God essentially said, do you know whose throne that is? And he said, I have no idea. And he said, that was Lucifer's. He lost it. You are going to claim it when you die. So this is, I'm not saying this is, this is formal accepted Catholic theology. But one of the ideas is, is that the angels lost their place in heaven permanently. They can't repent because they knew to the end of time, the, the ramification of their choice. They're never going to say I was young and dumb and I needed the money. And now right, I'm sorry, right. take me back. They knew what they were doing. They can't get their spots back. God gave us an opportunity through free will to work ourselves through this life and attain the spot that they lost and be in heaven with God. So you got this creature that's vicious and spiritually more powerful who lost its spot with God with utter bliss. And you've got these mortal beings and these souls fused together, these human beings that have a shot to get your birth up there in heaven. So they're clawing at us, trying to take as many of us out and, and in sour grapes, denying us that chance. And that's why they fight so hard to corrupt us and try to take us down. Mm. Uh, I appreciate everything, Adam. We do have a question, and this came in from uh, one of our audience members through Twitter. Vintage Vince asks, good morning. I message you because I have no one else to turn to. I don't know if you have experience in spirits, but I believe spirits follow me. It's to the point where I cannot sleep. Uh, almost every night I dream of spirits. Some I befriend and some are just not so friendly. My girlfriend wakes me up because I'm screaming. I see spirits and feel that they're here. Sometimes they whisper in my ear while I'm laying in bed. This morning, my dog woke up scared and jumped into bed. As I laid down, a deep, angry voice whispered more in my ear. Then the closet began making noises. Just now, before my girlfriend left, I told her I was freezing and she said, our room is boiling. It's hot. I don't know what to do. If there's any advice or anything I can do or articles I can read that'll make this stop, please point me in the right direction. I don't know who else to ask. Mm -hmm. 
so you know you would have to do a, a whole intake interview that would involve who they are how old they are their family background history of trauma mental and medical illnesses that they may or may not have or that run in their family uh whether they've been playing with the occult um whether they've been playing with black magic in the past you would need to know a ton of things and even then based on just that you couldn't say for sure that's spiritual or not that could be a form of psychosis where the person's hearing mm -hmm. voices because they're having a, a mental illness that's perhaps emerging so typically with a lot of mental illnesses in the late 20s or early 30s is when it starts to show itself and usually it's a it's at a time of stress um in life and so you'd want to be really careful and you'd want to i would say to that person start by ruling out the medical and the and the psychological which is more likely to be the case and make sure it's not that and i i deal with this at least once a year young man usually has schizophrenia it's just coming on for the first time they've been completely normal up until then and suddenly they're hearing voices and seeing things and having all these experiences they desperately don't want to take medication or face the fact that it's schizophrenia, even though it sounds just like it. And I'm not saying that's mm -hmm. just like schizophrenia, but they're very resistant to that. And they want to say it's an external thing. It's a spirit. Come take it away. And then usually it's six months of these conversations. They finally try the medication and suddenly all the symptoms go away and they say, oh, now I understand it really was schizophrenia. But as humans, we don't think reasonably. We, we often jump to these conclusions. Now, that might be spiritual. I'm not saying it's mental illness, might be spiritual. And if it's spiritual, work with your local spiritual leader. Whatever faith you're in, assuming it's a good faith, hope, you know, from my perspective, Catholic's great, Christian's great. Hopefully it's a good faith and you have a local spiritual leader, work with them, explain everything that's going on, see what remedies are provided within your faith system, but don't not go to the doctor when you're doing that. I would say right. do both, do both. Go to the doctor, say this is going on, and go to your minister, your priest, your your rabbi, whatever, and also get the spiritual at the same time. It's like knowing that your car has a problem. And, uh, you know, my, I'm obviously leaking oil. I just had the guy put some in. I don't have to worry about it again because the expert put oil in. Well, if you're aware that there's a leak, you need to continue to see and seek help so that uh, you don't end up stranded. You don't end up lost. And I'm not trying to simplify this, but I do want people to realize that there's more to this than just, as you said, a prayer, a simple prayer. And that can be a beginning for people. And the prayer of Michael, the archangel, I know has always been that we've one that we've recommended to people. Is that a good place to start for them? If they're looking for spiritual protection while seeking medical help as well? Yeah, sure. Michael is a great angel um, in the sense that he's recognized by all the Abrahamic religions. So Christianity, Judaism, and Islam all recognize Michael as basically the general in God's army of angels. So um, he's a wonderful angel to appeal to, and the prayer to St. Michael is a good prayer. The other thing I would say is the Psalms, if you're open to the Christian Bible. Uh, there are a number of Psalms. 72 is a great one, but there's a number of Psalms that if you read them, you can find them very comforting and kind of uh, protective also. Fantastic. Folks, the books are out and available. His new book, The Exorcism Files, the stories are true stories of demonic possessions, hauntings, possessions, and exorcisms, and The Catholic Guide to Miracles are out. We have links for all three of those books in our Amazon bookshop. So make sure that you go to paranormal60.com, click on the store, and then enter the uh, Amazon bookstore. You'll see all of the books that we cover there on the program. I want to thank Adam Bly for joining us. And uh, for more information on our guests, you can check out his website and his books. As I said, we have links for both of those on today's show guide. Stay tuned. When we return, Deliverance Minister Bill Bean joins me next on the Paranormal 60 with Dave Schrader. The Paranormal 60 Exorcism Files Facing Evil. We've already had a chance to speak with Adam Bly. Soon we will be speaking to Deliverance Minister Reverend Bill Bean. But first, I want to mention to you guys, we have something pretty interesting coming up. Spirits and Sixth Sense Retreat that's going to be taking place on June 10th and on June 11th. If you've ever been interested in learning more about our innate abilities, tapping in and trying to communicate with the bigger, broader scope 
of the world around us. This is going to be the event for you. Sarah Lemos will be doing a two hour presentation on protecting and opening yourself. The most important part about shielding, protecting, we're going to all get one that we get to keep and take home with us. This will help us do different uh, experiments with the supernatural. We're going to work on some telepathy. Uh, we're going to work on some other really interesting facets. I don't want to give too much away because Bill's really excited about what we've got going on. He'll have a two hour presentation and you'll all get the new device there as well. Shane Pittman and I will be leading an investigation that night at the Palmer house. And it's not your conventional investigation. We're going to be doing lots of different experiments on all the different floors, trying to connect not only with the other side, but with ourselves from floor to floor. We've had some strange experiences at the Palmer House, and I think that there's a lot more going on with time slip phenomena, telepathy, and more. So we're going to explore all of that. Again, coming up on June 10th is a one-day retreat, and on June 11th, tickets and information can be found very easily, very conveniently by visiting darknessevents.com or check out the links on today's program guide. I'd like to introduce you now to a longtime friend of mine, and he is somebody that I always lean on in times of darkness when I'm dealing with my own or I have people that are looking for help and have exhausted other, other choices and options. Reverend Bill Bean is a spiritual warrior, a deliverance minister, and an exorcist who has come to discuss the true danger of possession, his encounters, and the never-ending battle to defeat the powers of evil. Reverend Bean has a new book out. Let's take a look at that trailer now. Hi, this is Bill Bean, the Spiritual Warrior, and I want to tell you about my brand new book called Purge. This book is a must read for those that are seeking answers on how to deal with depression, grief, addictions, and spiritual attack. It's also a guidebook on how the mind, body, and spirit work together. The book also features a compelling chapter on spiritual warfare, along with having some very powerful spiritual warfare prayers. Purge is food for the spirit. I'm Bill Bean, the Spiritual Warrior, and the book is called Purge. Bill Bean, it is great to have you back. Thank you so much for joining us. It's always my honor and pleasure uh, to be on with you, Dave. Thank you so much for always having me back. Well, you know, you've always got interesting things to share with us, insights that I think are important for people that are fascinated with this field. And we were talking, of course, of some of the dangers in the first segment with Adam Bly. And many of those people that have come across darker forces run out of places to go. Um, obviously, there are paranormal teams out there offering help. Uh, I'm part of teams that offer help, but we also know our limitations. We know when things are beyond our capacity. And I know one of the most important aspects is cautiously, as an investigator, cautiously examining the information, the evidence before claiming something is demonic. And then before exclaiming that to your client, maybe having someone like Reverend Bill Bean on hand that can then take them through and usher them through, fill in Reverend Bean with this information. And Adam Bly or another religious person that you deal with, no matter what faith or denomination you're a part of, by having them kind of on board and understanding from the beginning, and then if you've determined that this is something outside of your realm of help, make sure that it goes to somebody like Reverend Bean, which we do often. I, I probably send you a dozen or more cases a year, Bill, that people are terrified. How many, how many deliverances, exorcisms do you do on a weekly basis? I know, sadly, th your business is up, right? Yeah, uh, way up. And, um, you know, due to the circumstances that are taking place in America and the world, uh, we've discussed this before, and it's worth repeating. All life operates on frequency and vibration. So if mm -hmm. our frequency and vibration is on high, then life is positive and good, and we're moving forward. But if our frequency and vibration is on low, then life is a challenge to say the least. And it's like the person has a black cloud over their head and there's always a problem, a situation. And of course, that's where the devil wants people to be, because when people are on that down on that low frequency and vibration, 
they are wide open and susceptible for demonic forces to come in and wreak havoc. So, yeah, but Reverend Bean, it's easier said than done. I've, I'm in a lifeless marriage. I hate my job. My kids are mean to me. My car's broken down. We barely get by week to week. How do you help lift somebody that's in that mindset? Because again, I've, I, I've spoken to people that are, I don't want to say negative, but they are being oppressed by their own life, which a lot of them may not even realize isn't them. Yeah. It's, it's something else influencing and oppressing them, making them feel broken. Yeah. It, does the old term fake it till you make it fit in these positions? Do you force yourself to be upbeat and smile and laugh and engaging so that you kind of, once you get that motion in motion, you get that energy back up. That's when things start to, to work better for you, whether you're in the mood to feel good or not. Mm, yes. And no. Um, yes. It's a good thing to try and uh, engage in that way of thinking to, even if it's not authentic, you're still, the person we we hope anyway is making some type of effort to even if it's make believe you're you're trying to go into the right direction for whatever reasons but for me and and i was in that life believe me i, I as you know i've suffered greatly you know in my childhood and and mm -hmm. really all the way through teenage years and into adulthood but it wasn't until i had an epiphany one day that i was sick and tired of living in that what exactly what you just described living in that type of lifestyle, which is fear-based, trauma-based way of thinking and living. So then what happens is when a person gets immersed in that, it becomes a way of life. And then the person will report to others, here's what happened today. Guess what? Here's the latest. You are now in this cycle of negativity, which guess what? Is going to amplify and magnify negativity on that person mm -hmm. when they're in that type of thing. So for me, it was really a titanic effort. It was two steps forward and three steps backward because when we develop behavioral patterns, it is very difficult to break out of those. So you really got to want it and right. set that as a goal to say, hey, this is not my life anymore. Uh, I'm happy to tell you and, and your uh, viewers and listeners that, yes, I was a victim. Yes, I suffered greatly. Not anymore. I am a victor. And I praise God for that. I can never thank him and praise him enough for it. But it took effort on my part as well to say, I'm not going to live like that anymore. I'm not going to have, I used to wake up, Dave, I can remember days that I would wake up and say, you know what, this day is going to suck. And guess what? It did because I invoke that through that uh, invocation and invitation and that negativity, of course it sucked. Right. And so now in my life, I declare victory in each and every day of my life. I refuse to lose. Am I perfect? Absolutely not. Is my life perfect? No. However, my life is uh, 50 times more blessed than it has ever been cursed. And I had a life that I was really seeking death. And now I have a life that I wouldn't trade my life with anybody or with anybody's life on this planet. And that is a miraculous transformation. And if God would do that for me, he'll do it for anybody. But we have to want that. And we have to put that uh, effort forward as well. You've, we've had you uh, through the years on the different programs I've been a part of, whether it was Coast to Coast or Darkness Radio. Yeah. Now here on the Paranormal 60, talking about your experiences. And I know that they've covered some of them on the hit TV series, A Haunting. Yeah. Um, they've also now started to delve into the cases in which you've helped families that are dealing with this. Um let's face it, most of everybody's vision of what an exorcism and a possession is like comes strictly from television and movies. That's yeah. the best we've got. Can you tell me how close to reality are most of these things? Um, I've, I've heard of levitations. I've heard of speaking in tongues. I've heard of markings appearing on people's faces or bodies that this truly does take place in some of the worst case scenario possessions. But could you be in the presence of somebody possessed and not even know it? Mm, it well, I'll say it like this again. Yes and no. Um, yes, because perhaps at times, you know, the person is but possessed 24 seven. And I don't mean you specifically because no, you, you have the gift of discernment, but like, could I be around somebody I don't even realize is dealing with that trauma. And then when they go home, all hell breaks loose and their life is out of, out of sorts because of these dark forces. It is possible, and uh, but I will say this, 
and I think you're one of these people that has um, a discernment. And so if someone were in your circle or you encountered someone, I think you would feel that you would feel that something was off. Um, but the, and what you described there, Dave, I have seen those things. I have seen levitation. I have seen people's eyes change from, you know, our normal looking eyes to um, all white, all black, red. And in one case, uh, the eyes were like a yellowish greenish type of color with reptilian slits that went and replaced the pupils. I'll never, ever forget it. Um, so I've seen those things. I've seen people levitate. I have seen and heard people, uh, an external voice coming from within a person was not their voice. Um, females with deep masculine voices, um, superhuman strength. I have been in physical encounters to where my life was on the line mm -hmm. uh, in certain instances. And if not for the power of God working through me to combat that, I could have very easily have ended up dead. And there are other cases of priests and uh, pastors that went in and attempted this and got injured. Uh, so, I mean, this is really heavy duty stuff. And I could not do what I do, A, without the calling from God. I didn't choose to do this. He chose me to do it. And B, I must be in complete faith and not have any fear at all. If you go into a situation like that and you're an agent for God and you're going and God working through to help a person or people and you show a level of fear it's all over with it's a, it's over for you it's over for the people that you're trying to help so you must in, in my situation i have to be in control and i cannot have any fear no matter what and i'll tell you just off the top of my head thank you right now i've had cases to where uh people wanted to shoot me wanted to stab me um uh people tried to bite me people have spit on me people have hit me um one case, a uh, person broke a shard of glass off, broke a window, is about a 12 inch shard of glass, trying to slash me with that, uh, on and on and on. So I have been in these situations to where I've seen things. If you were with me or somebody, you rub your eyes and go, did I just see that? Did that person just levitate? Did they really, did their eyes really change? Like there's another case in San Francisco. Um, I was performing the exorcism uh, over this young man. And as the demon was leaving him, his face went into a triangle. His, his cheeks went up like that. His chin came down like that. And the demon exited out through the top of his head. I will never, ever forget that. Now, I, I want to mention something. Um, and I want to address this up front. Uh, Reverend Bean is usually the one I send when people have exhausted all other options. And you think, well, why do you wait that long? Well, because in some cases, I, I tell people, well, you know, are you on medication? What are you dealing with? If they send me photographs yeah. and I see that there's physical issues going on, I'm, I'm a little bit quicker to, to spin them towards somebody for help. But I do try to get an assessment of what kind of person we're dealing with before I pass them on. It doesn't mean that even if I think they're crazy, that they might not be crazy because of what's afflicting them. So I'm not, I'm not throwing the baby out with the bathwater in yeah. some of these cases. And it can be terrifying, absolutely terrifying to deal with this. Um, when in your, in your work, um, you are paid to help people. Yeah, and true. I know a lot of people are like, Oh no, that shouldn't. Well, Reverend Bean spends the better part of each week out traveling, doing what he can to help people. And he goes to extraordinary lengths to do so. And, um, that's powerful. That's really powerful and takes a lot of time and effort. And in some instances, his life is on the line. So I want people to understand that. He also does it through um, Skype and, and other protocols. Yeah. So there are other ways to communicate and, and help, but I just want to put that out there so nobody's sidelined if they suddenly reach out afterwards and realize there is a fee. But you're not paying for the mir miraculous. You're not paying for the ex exorcism. You're paying the time of a man who's coming out and putting his own life on the line to and do And I'm glad things. you're saying this, uh, Brother Dave, because, uh, look, if I were independently wealthy, I wouldn't charge anybody a dime. And furthermore, I've probably helped as many people for free as I have uh, charging. You know, if someone says I don't have the money, I don't turn them away. Um, but this is how I make my living. So God has called me into this service and at the same time provided me a way to make a living. I'm not getting rich off of anybody, but I'm able to pay my bills. And I thank God and praise God for that. I don't have time to work a, a full time regular job. There is no time. I get to bed uh, regularly. 
6 a.m., 6.30 a.m. Every single morning of my life, uh, just a couple of nights ago, I was doing a session with a lady in Argentina. Uh, I've helped people in 52 countries, and that is by the power of God working through me. And I could not do it, and I couldn't sustain it either. Just think about that. Uh, you know, getting to bed at 6, 6.30 a.m., and then when you put travel on top of that, that's exhausting as well. Um, this is supernatural in its own to where God has been able to sustain me for this uh, period of time, all these years, to be able to do this. Tell me about one of the most terrifying experiences for you. Well, I could think of plenty. Um, one took place in 2017. And um, upper middle class family, beautiful home, wonderful neighborhood. You'd never guess that something like that was taking place there. And usually what happens is when I arrive at the scene, I will say a land blessing first before I right. go in. Well, okay. on this day, the husband, as soon as I pull up, you know, it's like five, I have 5.45 in the evening, something like that. Uh, it's getting dusk. As soon as I pull up, the husband opens the door. He is there waiting, and he's terrified. And, and so he opened the door, and I look behind him, and, and the wife was about 20 feet behind him in the living room, and she was hissing at me. So my game plan went out the window. I have, usually have a game plan starting with that land blessing. Well, that's out the window now because this person is absolutely showing signs of demonic possession. So I walk in. I uh, still have my bag in hand. I walk in, greet the husband, walk past him. And now this voice is coming from this woman, not her voice, a deep masculine voice calling me every wicked foul name you could think of, spitting at me, uh, saying, you can't have her. She's ours. You'll never have her. Uh, she's ours, et cetera, et cetera. So I continue to advance. I am now, so in this for me and how God calls me to do it, Mm -hmm. The best defense is a strong offense. So I, I can't show any fear and I am in full warrior mode moving forward. So I'm advancing towards her. She's backing up and she had a, a glass uh, in her left hand and I backed her into the corner. And when I backed her into the corner, she came out and tried to hit me with that glass. I blocked it. Thank God. And then she uh, grabbed a hold of me and it became a physical struggle. And thank God I was able to subdue her enough to get her down. Now, just try and picture this scenario. Here, this woman, uh, and she had superhuman strength, by the way. Um, so here she is. We're now engaged in a physical battle. I'm not trying to hurt her. I'm trying to subdue her. She's trying to hurt me, the demons inside of her, uh, trying to bite me, still spitting on me. And here I am with one hand trying to subdue her, the other hand, I had a Bible and then put that down and, and got my holy mixture that I use. I use a mixture of holy water, holy oil, and holy salt, frankincense. And now I'm, you know, flicking that on her and binding and rebuking and casting out. And this went on for at least 20 minutes. Now, in a fight, if a person is in a physical fight with someone, that fight might last uh, a minute to seconds before it's either broken right. up, it's going to go to the ground, it's not going to last long. And that in itself is exhausting. Uh, just think about that now. And now we've got a struggle going on for 20 minutes and no exaggeration. And so the whole time I'm binding, rebuking and casting out and it's just going back and forth. And then finally, I could feel it. And then I'm seeing it to where it wore these demons down. And God was showing me that this was not over. So there was a, a moment of calm and peace. It stopped. And I'm saying, by the mighty power of Yahweh and his mighty and holy name in Jesus' name, I bind and rebuke you and cast you out and command you to depart. So I'm in full authority by the power of God working through me the entire time. So now there's this lull, this, this calm. So now, now my plan is, is to, to get this woman um, up on her feet and to get the husband told me that there was uh a large shower, a walk-in shower in the master bedroom, which was on the first floor. So that's my plan now to get her in there and start this process again of exorcism and baptism as well. It's very important. Baptism is a very important part of this. So I get her up. She's crying. I'm gently getting her and the husband's there as well. We're, we're getting her uh, to the shower area. And uh, he turns the water on just before 
getting her in, it starts all over again. Now there's a physical struggle again. All these different voices are coming out of her, and I'm binding and rebuking and casting out each demon that manifests through her one by one. Finally get her in the shower. What I'm in a suit, by the way. I'm soaked. I've got spit all over. You just wouldn't believe it. You'd have, you would have had to have seen it for yourself to believe it. Um, so the battle continues, and uh, that probably went on for another 10 minutes in the shower. And then I get her, my, my final plan is to get her over to this large soaker tub. The husband's filling the water there. I want to get her in there so I can perform the final part of the exorcism and get her baptized. Therefore, she becomes blessed, sealed, sanctified, purified, cleansed, and made holy before God. So get her out of the shower and the struggle starts again. And more of these voices, it had to be at least 20 different voices coming out of this woman and I'm binding and rebuking and casting out each and every one of them finally get her in the tub and now I start to talk to her and I'm saying to her I know you're in there I know you hear me uh, God is doing his part I'm doing my part as an agent for God I need you to do your part now I need you to fight and it's time for you to be free from all this and so this continued on and on voice after voice binding and rebuking and casting out and then I could feel the uh, evil losing its grip on her. And, and just have this visualization. Imagine uh, someone grabbing you by your shirt collar and holding you against the wall. And you're like on your tiptoes. And then when they let you go, it's like, you know, it's like right. this release and relief. That's exactly what was going on here. And the, the more we invoke the power of God over this woman, the more that I spoke to her, you could feel it all turning and all starting to leave her. And then it got to the point where she slumped. And that's in most cases, that's what happens is they slump like that. And then they start to cry and then they are free. And that's exactly what happened in that case. And then I performed the baptism over her and that completely changed her life. I praise God for it. And I was totally exhausted after that was over with. I recall uh, I met with some people, six or eight people. I left them. I, I, wait a minute, I'm getting ahead of myself. Mm -hmm. After this took place, after she was freed from this, then I had to go through the entire home, which was a very large home. I'm already exhausted, but I had to go through that home and bind and rebuke and cast out any demons that might be hiding or lurking there. And that requires me, uh, me to be very thorough, Dave. I have to go through every part of that home, including the attic, under the beds, in the closets, everything. And so um, after that took place, you know, blessing the home and the land, I left them. I left them very well. Um, and I recall leaving there and going to a diner in New Jersey. And I sat there with my head in my hands. And I just prayed that God would help me to get the energy back just so I could get back in my vehicle and drive home. That's how exhausting mm -hmm. this was. I'll never, ever forget it. And we could talk all day long about case after case, but that one stands out uh, among the many. Did you, during any of that battle, did you ever think, oh my God, I'm losing ground. I, I, I might get hurt. This, this could be, this could be bad for me as well. I didn't think that it was losing ground, but I'll tell you what, it was a real struggle. And I praise God for being with me to be able to combat that because if not for the power of God working through me, I would have been overcome. Uh, because she was that powerful, that, uh, that demonic force working through her was incredibly powerful. And yeah, something very bad could have happened out of that. She was physically attacking her husband. Her husband was a military man, very good man. He never experienced anything like that in his life. And he was terrified. I, this is such a weird question to even have to ask you, Reverend Bean, but do you put things in place to protect yourself? And I don't just mean spiritually. I mean, you're holding a woman, you're wrestling, you're trying to hold her in place to do this. If God forbid a rib broke or an oh, arm broke, my goodness. right. In, in those instances, I mean, that just seems like uh, a lawsuit waiting to happen. Do you have waivers and things that you make them be a part of so that they know, you know, there's a danger on both sides of this and I'm coming in to help? Yeah, absolutely. So they're aware that, uh, you know, there's no, and there's certainly no intent, intent on my part for that, but you're right. Mm -hmm. You're talking about a real physical struggle here. So right. something could happen in that way, in the way of a bone breaking or, oh, God forbid, I hope it never happens. It never right. has. And I praise God for it, but it is very possible 
that something like that could happen. How could somebody who's afflicted sign or allow you in? Do, are the demons that arrogant and overconfident to think we're going to throw you around like a ragdoll boy? You don't have a chance of standing up against us. I would think that they would be doing everything in their power to keep you from getting in that home. Oh, well, that's true. But there are those that will consent because it's not like the person possessed 24 seven. So they will have hours of normalcy, but it's mm -hmm. really not even normalcy because when you see that a person is possessed, man, you, you not only can you feel it, but there is a physical change on this person's part and they are just so drained and withdrawn and depressed right. and just everything negative that you can imagine. And um, so that part of them, when they are in, uh, and I say, I guess this is the best way to explain it maybe, is that when a possession takes place, it's like this demonic force is literally unplugging the mind and the thoughts of mm -hmm. the victim. And they're taking over that body. Right. And, you know, oftentimes the person does not remember anything at all that has taken place. And it is because technically their mind is not there because this external force has plugged in. Um, so when the person has these moments of not being afflicted in that way, they want help. They, they definitely they don't want to be that way anymore. However, I'll say this, there is a flip side. And I've been in a few of these cases as well to where the person did want to be that way and enjoyed being that way. Uh, one young man I could think of, he was part of a satanic uh, cult and he was uh, engaged in ritual animal sacrifice and he was placing curses, hexes, vexes, and spells on people. And he enjoyed every minute of it. And that was one of the more severe cases as well. And what I have to do also, Dave, is I, I just don't go in guns a-blazing. I did on what I described to you uh, on that one day. But in other cases, I want to sit down with the people. And I want to know what, what the origin of this is. What right. took place? You know, how did this come about? And usually it is through a trauma. And in that young man's case, it was uh, being molested as a child. Mm -hmm. And that created so much anger and rebellion and a feeling that God had abandoned him. And so um, he was picked on. He was bullied. And so finally, he makes this deal with the devil. And, um, and he feels like he becomes empowered. And uh, it was the family who called me because he was starting to attack his parents and other family members. And they were afraid that he was going to kill somebody. And so I went into this thing and this kid hated my guts. He didn't want me to be anywhere near him. And that was another titanic struggle that took place that uh, uh, praise God for working through me to be able to overcome that. But mm -hmm. in the end, after the exorcism took place, and that was another exhausting uh, situation there. After it was all over with, he came with me as I was going through blessing the house and all mm -hmm. that. And we took a big trash bag and we went into his room. And we took all these knives and daggers and all this satanic paraphernalia, everything. And we filled that trash bag up with that stuff. You Again, that's another thing you would have had to see for yourself to understand what I'm saying to you. Um, just miraculous because this young man, right. he didn't want to be free. And he was very happy doing what he was doing. Yet God created that miracle to free him. And after it was over, he was hugging me. The family was hugging me. It was a wonderful thing that they got their their grandson back, their son back, you know, right. their brother back. Uh, just a wonderful, wonderful thing. But I very, think very what, what we'll need to do is have you come back as our time is up and maybe we'll do an episode <laughs> on the origins of evil and hear how these people just giving me some of the openings because, OK, we understand that boy called it in. But there are other people that don't seem to call things in or yes. even understand how they get there. So I'd love to tackle that topic maybe in a month or so. We'll have you back to, to do something like that. Let's Reverend Bean, thank you for joining us. We have a link up for your website where they can get your book and they can keep up with your work and activities there. So thank you so much for being a part of the show again with us today and, and for the work that you do. Thank you, my brother. Love and God bless you and your family and, and love and God bless everybody out there. Thank you. Thank you. All right, folks. Uh, one hell of a ride. Crazy stuff. You know, although we are fascinated by the paranormal, this this is not a subject that should be taken lightly. It can have adverse effects on us or, God forbid, the people around us that we love. 
even the people that come to help us. In order to stand up to dark forces, you really need to have had a calling to it. Be someone in the right frame of mind, free from addictions, vices, and other things that the demonic realm can exploit to use and break you. That in itself is a very tall order. And I know you may want to help others. Sometimes the best way to help is to assess the situation, remain calm, be thorough in your work and research before you jump to the conclusion that you're dealing with the devil. Then, most importantly, seek help from professionals like Adam Bly or Reverend Bill Bean or others of that ilk. And if you're in the midst of dealing with something in your own life, please do not just let anyone in to investigate or help rid you or your home of this type of energy. Ask for credentials. Ask for three or four referrals of others that they've helped. Anyone that actually cares will know how important that is to vet them. I'd like to thank our guests tonight, Adam Bly. Make sure to pick up his books in my Amazon shop to Reverend Bill Bean and a special thanks to both men for the work that they do to help others afflicted with this darkness. Thank you all for visiting the Paranormal 60 and allowing me along on your journey. May the darkness be just a little more light with the information that we've shared here. Keep your vibration high. Protect yourself. Live, laugh, and love with reckless abandon, as that is the energy that makes it extremely hard to be affected by dark forces. That energy repels them. Make sure to like this video and this podcast. Subscribe. Tell everyone you know about it. And for our new podcast listeners, please rate and review this show on whichever platform that you listen. Go ahead. Give it five stars. It costs you nothing, and you'll feel good about yourself. We'll see you next week right here on the Paranormal 60 with Dave Schrader and this Friday with the Paranormal 60 Minutes newscast. This program is part of the UnX network. Check out UnX for other great programs just like this one. 